Psychosocial Wednesdays. This is an initiative by me, Paul Itanello, Stefano Carpani, and Bernhard von Goretzky. More than a century ago, Freud gathered colleagues for Wednesday meetings that opened the world of psychoanalysis to a wide range of powerful ideas. Psychosocial Wednesdays are modeled on those Wednesdays and on Jung's meetings at the Psychological Club and feature speakers from different psychoanalytic tra traditions, schools, and associated fields. Tonight we have as a guest Polly Young Eisendra, which uh, I'm very pleased about. I first saw Polly some years ago when she spoke in Edinburgh. It was at a point when I had been visiting the Jung Institute in Zurich, enjoying studying but not really working at it. When she spoke, I thought, if this is the kind of work Jungian analysts do, I want in on it. So, uh, very grateful to see her here. She's going to speak about the meaning of contagion, masks, toxins, and the fear of infection. So, welcome, Polly, and I'll let you start. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everyone. And since I haven't seen Andrew in many years, I want to do a particular hello to Andrew, who happens to be showing up on my screen. So, um, I want to talk about this topic because of my own distress and uh, the ways in which I have noticed shifts in my clinical practice as well as in my community around the issue of mask wearing and around the, uh, what I would say, the fear and fantasy of contagion and how those issues have become more problematic as the contagion factor has lowered. So I live in central Vermont in the US and we have flattened our curve, which was never much of a curve anyway. For the last three and a half weeks, the curve has been flat. Uh, many days we have no new cases. We've had in, in our state, which has uh, only 620,000 people, We've, we've had uh, 55 deaths, and most of those have been in nursing homes. Um, and the, as the curve has flattened, uh, mask wearing has become mandatory in a number of establishments in order to enter. And um, in some of the towns, including our biggest city, Burlington, um, children who are three years old and up have to wear masks. Uh, as well as all adults, except I've heard that African-American men are not mandated to wear masks. And so the masks have become a part of our uh, community as the, um, as the contagion factor has lowered. And I, I realize, you know, I'm not in a densely populated area here, but um, I also was interested in speaking about this topic because I was interviewed on a, a program called Growing Good Humans, a podcast. And, um, and the, uh, the host there, Lisa Pressman, asked me to talk about how, how children might perceive the wearing of masks and the seeing of masks on adults. And um, in doing the research for that program, of course, I, I went back to the initial infant studies that show that the blank face of an adult for a young infant is, is terrifying. And so the way that ch children look at grown-ups wearing masks is really very different than the ways that we look at each other, perhaps. So um, there are several things I wanna sketch out in the beginning, and then I'd like to take some questions and kind of move back and forth between um, my thoughts and your thoughts and your questions. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say this as a review, but I always think it's worth saying that a great deal of our communication takes place unconsciously. We know also that we are fundamentally uh, unconscious as beings. Of course, Jung thought that without all of the measurements, but uh, now the neuroscientists say 95% to 99% unconscious. What that means is that we simply do things in an automatic way, uh, like, for example, you get into your car and then you arrive at home. You can't really remember driving home at all. Um, so we have very bad working memories and our memories, which there are 
five different kinds of memories in humans in different parts of the brain. The memories, uh, the memory systems we have conflict as well. Um, so a lot of our communication takes place through gestures, signals, tone of voice implication, uh, actually very little through language and very little is remembered from what people say. It's much more the way they look and also the tone of voice. Now, these things are probably obvious. If you're, if you're a therapist or an analyst, you, you know this material already, but I like to remember it because it enters into the issues that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, the way that I understand projective identification, um, and we could say also Jung's idea of the participation mystique, uh, is that there's a sort of an emotional kidnapping of one person by another. Sometimes it's very subtle. It happens all the time in ordinary communication and the other person plays out whatever that kidnapping is about, maybe without not even knowing it. So I'll give a quick example in case, uh, sometimes I think psychoanalysts have made this topic too complicated and too abstract. And so don't really understand how ordinary the communication is. So uh, I do a couples therapy that's called dialogue therapy. In the first meeting, when the couple comes in, I ask the two people to talk to each other about their reasons for being there. I let them know that I'm gonna get all the background information, that they can talk in any way they want to with each other about why they're there. I'd say about 80% of the time, one person says, why don't you begin? Now that person has begun. The other person generally takes that order and begins. And sometimes the tone of why don't you begin is more or less like, I'm tired of talking to you, so why don't you begin? Sometimes it's more like, I'm sort of shy, so why don't you begin? And sometimes it's more like an invitation, like why don't you begin? But in any case, it's confusing because the person who's speaking has begun and has essentially given an order to the other person who then typically obeys and carries out that order and begins even if they're a little flustered. Or... So the projective identification there is that one person has implied, I'm taking control and you should listen and do it and the other person does it. And then there may be still more blowback between the two people because of that moment. Uh, sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. Um, so in ordinary life, there are many times when we direct others to carry aspects of ourselves or we want them to carry out something that we, you know, imagine they're thinking or feeling. And then once they do it, we confirm that they've done it. And uh, if, if this is an ongoing relationship, uh, like a couple relationship or uh, adults, a child and a parent, siblings, friends, adults particularly, uh, there can be a repetitive quality to chronic projective identification where one individual is projecting something, the other one is playing it out, and then is also going in the other direction. So there's evoking, projecting, identifying, and that's taking place often outside of words, outside of awareness even, often. Um, and this makes um, you know, communication very complicated for human beings. Um, and uh, there's one other little piece I want to just mention in regard to this. Um, as uh, Yuval Harari points out multiple times in Sapiens, uh, we as human beings uh, operate a lot on what he calls fiction. That is, we talk about what is not present, what we what is not in the room, what we're not doing. Um, and other animals, while they have complex language, cannot do that. So I can say, I saw Joe this morning and he was with your wife, but the higher apes can only say something like, pass the banana. Uh, they can't talk about Joe and his wife. So that gives us lots and lots of levels of meaning in which we are exchanging uh, implied ideas or emotional meanings outside of what we're actually talking about going on in any moment. So um, when it, in, oh, 
And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is um, the collective unconscious. So over the years, I have had different sorts of understandings of Jung's collective unconscious. And I've kind of settled on uh, the idea that is a part of Yogacara Buddhism um, that's Indian Buddhism from the third to the fifth century. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a name that's called home consciousness, the Aliya Vijnana, seed consciousness. And um, it's, it's a form of consciousness that is a stream of consciousness running sort of underneath our awareness, you might say, or outside of our awareness. And while we are unconscious of it, it is conscious. So we're unconscious of it, but the, there are motivations and intentions from this unconscious stream, this mind stream. And it's collective, it carries meanings of culture and language. Um, you know, from a Buddhist perspective, that's the, that's the consciousness that travels lifetime to lifetime. You enter into a mind stream, then you leave that mind stream, etc. Um, so from the point of view of the collective unconscious, uh, various kinds of topics or let's say meanings or emotional meanings come and go. So you might have, for example, certain kind of psychopathology that becomes popular. Around here, it was, uh, there was a lot of chronic fatigue syndrome uh, when I first moved to Vermont. Now it's almost completely disappeared. Uh, of course, multiple personality disorder when I was in Philadelphia. And maybe one of the current sort of popular thing, themes is my partner is a narcissist. That shows up a lot in a lot of conversation. Um, so we get into this thing that's called this pandemic. And it's the result of a virus that we don't know much about. And we still don't know much about it, even though we know more than we did two and a half months ago. So we don't know if the virus is happening naturally or if it's created by human beings. Um, and there's a lot of panic instilled in uh, our media and also in our communications with each other as soon as we come to hear about the idea that this virus is highly contagious. When we first heard about this, um, I wrote a Psychology Today blog uh, called um, uh, Taking a Pause. And in it, I mentioned that I was uncertain myself about why we were asked to, be, to stay at home and everything was closing, the schools were closing. and. Um, and the way I wrote that, Psychology Today wrote back to me and said they wanted to edit it out because it made it confusing as to what people should do. I, I wasn't questioning what people should do. I was simply raising my own question about not knowing why we were being directed as we were being directed. So immediately I knew there was something in the collective unconscious that I was activating by even sort of making the comment that I was here, I am in Vermont, sitting in central Vermont. I, at that point, uh, wasn't afraid of the virus. Um, and I was, uh, I'd also just come back from Barcelona where I'd seen a lot of Chinese people and I had gotten sick. And, but at, at that point, the symptoms I had um, didn't meet the um, symptoms that were being listed by the World Health Organization. Anyway, I, I realized even when I wrote that first blog that there was something about the idea that we were supposed to be afraid and we were supposed to shut down that was, that was coming into the collective mind. Um, so I, I started thinking about contagion at that point. And I, I realized, and with kind of a, a kind of a startle reaction one morning, early in the morning, that Number one, a lot of our rights were being taken away, particularly the right to assemble, um, and also that they were being taken away because of the idea of contagion. And then I recognized that in almost all of the sort of terrible project, projects of humanity, from Holocaust to witch hunts, the others were always contaminated they were always contagious and they had toxins that uh, that we had to protect ourselves against so either we had to round them up and put them somewhere 
or we had to cover them up in some way. And then I began to think of burkas and other kinds of body coverings for women because women communicate something by their very being and they're walking down the street and that's contagious to men and so you have to cover up so that they don't the men don't pick up on signals that are unwanted so i just started sort of riffing in my own mind on um on contagion and um and then that led me eventually to recognize that we were we were set up in this whole sort of framework and i don't think this was an an intentional setup i truly don't i think it was unintentional and yet it got picked up and used we were set up to moralize about this illness and to moralize about who is the bad one and who is the good one and um where i live because there was there's really no one that i mean i know some people through some people who have had um who have had sars um but no one i i know personally unless i did i don't know but i i didn't know people to avoid but i began to see that there were going to be other ways of sorting people out. We started out with social distancing. Um, a number of times I walked into shops where somebody told me to back up and I was more than six feet away from them. And, um, and then, you know, through just watching how that was happening and recognizing there's an archetype that is associated with being contaminated, um, I was wondering what was going to happen next. And that's when the mask wearing kind of came into um, the, um, at first it was a suggestion here in Vermont, and then it began to be mandated, particularly at the co-op where I shop. Um, and as the mask wearing came in, uh, there, was, there were more strict uh, regulations uh, so that going into shop, we every person had to stand in a separate parking space and there was someone with a bullhorn shouting at us about the regulations within the co-op and we all had to wear masks and then just recently less than a week ago uh, when I was walking into the co-op wearing my mask uh, and I was talking with a friend who was six feet apart the woman with the bullhorn shouted out no talking talking spreads the virus now this is after the curve is flattened and we're both wearing masks. And so I knew at that point that things had gotten to this point of um, a kind of a, a fascist-like feeling about the mask wearing, about the communication, and in particularly the spaces where I might have previously been pretty relaxed, which would be shopping at my co-op. So um, that, that sort of led me to think about a little bit more about what we communicate in the mask, um, certainly in the, the unconscious meaning of mask is to create a disguise, to cover up. Um, in, um, usually here in North America, no one would wear a mask except at Halloween or Carnival, th those kinds of events. And um, in looking up the research that, uh, in, that has been done, and there have been double blind studies, I didn't know that, but in dental health, um, and you can look them up yourself, on wearing the N95 mask, which is the most protective mask, um, they found that, um, that a dentist who had an infection would not fully protect his patient from the infection, his or her patient, by wearing the N95 mask. So and the only protection would be to wear the full plastic shield, shield over the face. Um, and remembering that, of course, um, no one has ever said that these masks protect ourselves. They only protect, supposedly, others if we're infected. So. Um, uh, that was interesting just to find out that even the most um, developed and the most official mask does not protect 
from the function that we're told we're protecting others from our own infection. Um, and then I looked uh, at the World Health Organization, found that they're very dubious about people wearing masks because we don't know how to deal with contamination, if there is contamination, with a mask. And then on top of that, there has never been a time when well people have worn masks except to cover up other kinds of things, like to wear a, um, if you're a woman, to cover yourself sexually or to wear a mask in, um, in a, uh, you know, a party or a time when you want to be disguised. That would be the reason why well people would wear masks. So um, the idea that well people now are wearing masks in order to protect other people from infection, even when there's, there's no real indication that there's anything contagious around, uh, I think is something to pay close attention to. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to say one more thing about <clears throat> the archetype of contagion and the way it plays out in terms of communications. So. You probably know that disgust is one of the primary emotions that human beings are born with. So human beings are born with, you can sort them as five or seven or nine primary emotions. And I like the five because they're easy to remember. So the two positive ones <clears throat> that are expansive are joy and curiosity. And then there is sadness and disgust and fear. So those are primary motivators in the human infant uh, for communication. So, so we express and we evoke emotions. It's a primary communicative system that we're born with. And of course, it's before language enters in, before culture enters in, before we're discriminating ourselves in that range of the collective unconscious, where we do, haven't yet developed our own consciousness of that um, and we're carried along in that early period of time by those primary emotions until we get to the secondary emotions or the social emotions which developed develop when we're 18 months to two years old those those um, secondary emotions promote our communications about self and other in groups those are emotions like shame and guilt and, and envy and self-consciousness, embarrassment, self-pity, uh, pride. Um, but disgust is the major motivator for morality. And it actually is the revulsion that the human infant feels um, when in contact with something that's toxic or dangerously toxic. So that pulling back and revulsion eventually organizes into our sense of morality, of things that we can trust and move towards, or things that motivate us to back off in disgust uh, or in revulsion. So contagion obviously is highly motivating for feelings of disgust and also um, self-protection. Uh, the mask wearing, I found, has kind of sorted itself into a certain kind of language, at least in my community. Um, and uh, as I have figured out the language, it seems to be that wearing a mask means that you are virtuous and compliant and not wearing a mask means that you are not virtuous and not compliant. Um, now, in different communities, I think there may be different variations on the mask and not the mask, but I think the wearing of the mask has become its own language, and the language has something to do with moralizing and creating splits and projective identification and essentially communicating either by tone of voice or by signal around whether you think the person is doing something wrong or doing something right. So that's one level of communication that's going on around mask wearing. Um, 
Then there's the other issue of not being able to see people's faces. And um, you know, when you're covered up, except for your eyes, it's very difficult to actually know what the person is feeling because we look at the whole face and especially the expression that leads from right around here up through the eyes to know what the person is feeling. So for children and for people who um, have any kind of apprehension about other people's motivations, which I'm beginning to get now, <laughs> since the mask wearing has become, become part of my community, um, there's a kind of anxiety about not knowing whether the person is smiling at you, whether the person is angry, uh, I, I found I've become kind of anxious in greeting people. I want to say hello, how are you doing? Because I want to tap into that sense of what's going on in your world um, because of the mask. So there are multiple levels of the masks be affecting us. There is the level of affecting children and children not knowing how to read the face of an adult that has a mask on. There's the level of what the mask signals in terms of um, moral standing. And then there is the general sense of masks actually being disguises for things that we want to hide. Uh, and um, then on top of that, and I think this is probably where I want to stop, um, there's the archetype of contagion itself and the way that it has been associated with. Um, with essentially putting some people away from others and keeping them away because of their toxicity and then feeling as though that's a good decision because it keeps others from um, being contaminated. So I'd like to stop now and just have a conversation about this. I have kind of downloaded everything that was on my mind about it. Um, and. Uh, Thank you for that was very steady, very powerful, a lot of really interesting material. You know, I work a great deal on HIV AIDS yes. and that whole way of thinking, uh, which is different and the same as this. So yes, yes, yes. It's exactly, I mean, I would say it's exactly in the ballpark. Well, uh, my, my own impression, and this is only an impression, is even though the disease is completely different, the panic is the same. It seems identical. Which is what's well, contagion. It's the yeah. issue, I think, of contagion plus disgust. Of course. You know. Um, a number of people have asked a factual question, first of all, because I don't think people are aware of what is happening in Vermont. Um, <laughs> I think Dennis was the Dennis Merritt was the first one to ask it, which is why are African American men not expected to wear masks? That seems Well, you know. I have to say that what I said about that is hearsay in the sense that I haven't actually read that rule, uh. but, um, but, but the person who said it to me is very trustworthy. So I'm going to assume that he has read it accurately. Mm -hmm. and, and here's my understanding. There was an objection on the part, so African-Americans are a rather small minority in Vermont. There was an objection on the part of African American men because to wearing masks because in the past, if an African American man was wearing a mask, people would think he was robbing a store. Right. Because it signaled that he was trying to disguise his identity in order to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. So that communication from the African American side was, was made mask wearing pretty unwelcome. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this stipulation of uh, allowing African-American men not to wear a mask if they, they didn't want to, they weren't mandated. In other words, I think it's connected to that. Yes, yes. Um, Leslie Gardner has pointed out the odd thing of Trump not wearing a mask, which leads us, of course, into Trump and the world. And that, yes, I don't know if you want to go there, but that is that has been a strange part of all of the images and photographs of the last weeks. Trump is the one with no mask. So, you know, I think the more interesting thing is why are we reading everything in terms of masks? Mm -hmm. You know, when did that sort of start happening that we're reading people by whether they're wearing a mask or not 
and we don't really know the situation they're in or the level of actual contagion around them, we're just reading a mask. And to me, that's much more, I think I said at the beginning, and it might have been when um, Stefan um, uh, interviewed me, or, or somebody interviewed me anyway, uh, when I said that I was more concerned about people's responses, people responding to the virus than the virus itself, because I, I did look into quite a bit of research on the virus right at the beginning and tried to inform myself. Um, and I, I actually had H1N1, um, which is not the same. It's not a SARS virus, but it's mm -hmm. in that same respiratory type of viruses. Yeah. And I did get pneumonia from it. Um, and I, you know, I realized that the virus, I, I thought for everything I could read, that the virus was going to have difficult impact but that it wasn't going to be at the level of the model statistics for death. Mm -hmm. So I thought, yeah, this is going to be a tough run and we're going to have to be careful, but I'm more concerned about what's happening with this virus, with the panic and the, the sense right away that, you know, we have to shut things down and we have to wear masks because I knew that right away there was a, creation of an us and them about the virus that was very strong and plus the fact that I had just been in Barcelona on Chinese New Year's and I'd been in a customs line with maybe it was I don't know hundreds of Chinese people maybe a thousand Chinese people in a long customs line that was three hours long some people were wearing masks some weren't I was I knew about the virus at that point I think it was January 28th Mm -hmm. But I was thinking, okay, you know, I didn't wear a mask. I sort of thought, well, I get the virus, I get the virus, you know, I'm here on Chinese New Year's. I don't know, somehow I was measuring something called risk against something called benefit, and I wanted to have a good time. Mm -hmm. And it seems that now risk has gotten really heightened, and the benefits of us, say, assembling or communicating openly with each other, those benefits haven't really entered into the conversation. And I'm just gonna bring one other piece in here because I forgot to say it. So in the course of this, of the, the uh, pandemic here in Vermont, and I know about a number of suicides, and I also know about a, a couple of deaths in nursing homes and care facilities. And something that I feel very strongly about is the fact that family members were not even given the choice of putting on a hazmat suit in order to be able to visit somebody who's in a nursing facility to oversee their care or to visit them when they're dying during this pandemic. Consequently, people have died because they've gotten pneumonia and the staff, not not to the SARS-related pneumonia, but just a pneumonia because the staff was overwhelmed and anxious and weren't checking on individuals and no family members were overseeing their care. And so nobody was given a choice even to decide whether there's a benefit in being close to a loved one in a so-called care facility, even if it's not a nursing home, but residential care, you know, to, to be able to wear protective gear and go in. So we decided, no, those people are going to be considered off limits. Um, so that's the kind of risk benefit analysis that seemed to go out the window. Um, you know, as soon as we came in with the idea of contagion, and then we began to read masks and that started, you know, a whole other conversation. So I went a bit off on a sidebar there, but I wanted to bring in. I do, by the way, I do also sense there's a difference between the uh, risk and benefit measurements of the medical personnel who do yeah. not trust normal people to listen, which is probably fairly smart, and the way normal people then interpret that and or regard it as either perfect or failing, right? It's, it's so difficult there. Well, that's in the nature of contagion also. I mean, as soon as you introduce the idea of contagion, people become afraid 
and they're going to react through more disgust. They're going to be motivated to, you know, protect themselves and also to move away from uh, anyone who is thought to be in the contagious group, whether or not that person is in the contagious group. Um, and, you know, it is true that the World Health Organization did not take a position on mandatory mask, ma mask wearing. And it's also true that there's never been a double blind study or any study of well people wearing masks. But there were a lot of medical people who commented in newspapers about, well, that might be okay to wear a mask. But what I've often heard is, well, okay, maybe it really doesn't protect anybody, but what does it hurt anybody to wear a mask? Mm -hmm. And I would say, yes, okay. I think it can. I think it can. I think it sets up a kind of false communication and that I think we're pretty motivated as humans to, um, to moralize and to deal with the issues of purity and impurity. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd love to jump on something that goes in that direction because we assume we protect ourselves that way. Yes. And again, I think these are archetypes. You know, I don't think these are individual issues. I mean, some individuals take it further than others, but um, because, you know, if you, if you tend to be sort of a paranoid person or you in sort of a paranoid schizoid state, you might take it a little further. But I do think all of us have to be careful not to use that sense of us and them because it's right there always, yes. you know, and um, so, yes, I, so I think that wearing masks needs to have a much more complicated conversation than what we're having, uh, recognizing that scientifically it doesn't carry any water at all. Now, if you're, if you're working in a place where there is contagion, you should probably wear complete protection, mm -hmm. not a mask. That's what comes out of the research on masks. There are a couple of rather dense comment questions, if I may. Let me sure. hear the first one. This is, um, pardon me, they're moving rather fast now. Arg. Ah, technology. Um, uh, Dominique Marguerite asked, asked and said, masks are also communicating that for this period of time, the awareness of my being socially linked to you and my link to you could be harm. Wait, masks are also communicating that for this period of time, the awareness of my being socially linked to you. Right, okay. And my link to you could be harmful and I will wear a mask to minimize that. Is that anything to say? I, I, I think she's point? correct. I think she's mm -hmm. correct because again, the idea is I am, so again, we have to kind of think of the, the I like, I'd like to think about this wearing disguises for women, particularly because I had a long conversation once when I was in Thailand, while I was participating in a conversation with Buddhist monks about why women can't even brush past their robes or uh, come into certain monasteries. The idea wasn't, was not, that the monks had something in their own eyes that made it difficult to look at a woman. Mm -hmm. The idea was that the woman brought in with her this kind of disturbance to the monks, that she brought in with her this seductiveness, or she brought in with her this sort of atmosphere of something that stirs up the monks. So covering up the woman, keeping her away, is the way we'll handle this. It's not, in, it's not in their eyes, it's in her body. It's that same idea. Yes. You cover it up because it's in you that you're protecting others from what is troubling or bad. They can't take it on. So yes. I think she's on it, yes. Yes. Um, Andrew, here, Andrew Samuels, here's a substantial one again. This, one, <laughs> um, this, is, this is good, but it's huge, I'll warn you. <laughs> Could you run the mask theme through the filters of gender, race, and socioeconomics? Would you agree that there is variation that may not fit easily with archetype, unless archetype means basically what grabs or possesses one's attention over time? So, gender, race, <laughs> money, wealth. <laughs> 
Well, I like the question. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and yes, the way I look at archetype is that it's a constraint on our perception, imagination, ability to think. And I think the constraints have to do with our embodiment, our emotions, our instincts, the way we're hardwired, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, I consider archetype to be in that way. And yes, I think the variations by gender, race, age, oh, lots of things, whether or not you're Trump, you know, um, the variations are, are limitless, actually, probably, you know, on what specifically the mask might be communicating. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think especially because I have thought a lot about the burqa and talked to women who liked wearing the burqa mm -hmm. as well as women who felt denigrated by wearing the burqa. It's powerful, powerful communicator. And it almost always means um, covering up what is too difficult for you to handle. And, mm -hmm. or, you know, if the woman likes wearing it, it's like I'm covering it up so you don't even have to interact with me because mm -hmm. I don't even want to interact. Um, but if she's made to cover it up, then she feels like I have to cover this up because it's too hard for others to deal with it. So yes, there are lots of variations for the black man. It might be, you know, I'm robbing the convenience store. For the woman, it might mean something else. For the child, it might mean a sort of frightening to see faces without knowing what the motivations are from those faces because most of the face is hidden. Sure. Um, but I think it's a strong communication for everybody. And whether it has conscious meaning like virtuous or not virtuous or whatever, I think there's an unconscious meaning that's going on at the same time. Um, and I think that unconscious meaning is further stirring our anxieties about our situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that people are more anxious now that we know something about the virus and that the curve the curve is flattened here. And I have people who don't, I have a couple of people that don't want to come out to come to therapy mm -hmm. because they have adapted to staying at home. And then I have, you know, I saw a couple where the, the couple came in wearing masks. They had asked me to wear a mask. And I said, look, I'll wear the mask, but you guys live together. I'm not afraid of you and I need to read your faces. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to allow you to wear a mask. And they were thrown by that. Okay. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, folks. <laughs> you know, it's like they live together. I needed to read their faces. The mm. protection would have been from whatever I might have to them, mm. but they were feeling comfortable wearing masks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are some more dense questions. This is Leslie Gardner. This is a horizontal move, but I think an inevitable one. It's been scary to watch the riots because many people are wearing masks, black men included, as they set fire or loot. It's a strange combination of action. I don't know if it's- Yes, to take I know, I think it's very, I, I like to comment again, because it makes us more conscious of what's going on. Yes. You know, and yes, 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 it hides most of the face. And, uh, you know, I mean, Again, within the craziness of all this, I've had people say to me, and these are not people coming in therapy because the, uh, the protests have started. You know, I, I haven't been working. I don't work on Mondays in therapy. Um, but, but, but friends um, say, well, yes, they're, they, you know, they're rioting, but at least they're wearing masks. <laughs> it's like, whoa. That is interesting. That is interesting. That's, that's, that's like, <laughs> uh, Actually, this is from Tiffany Hook Loomis. Excuse me if I'm mispronouncing that. This is sort of a denser version of the same thing. As many are aware of the pandemic of racism that has been most elevated this week and weekend in America, I am curious if you see this archetype of contagion also at play here. Watching the video of the murder of Floyd makes me think about the connection between contagion and disgust, that was interesting, and the terrible abuse of power 
that comes with this sense of morality one aligns with when there is a projection of contagion about a whole group of people who are, of course, most affected by this virus. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, of course, racism was based on the idea of something bad in people who have dark skin or who look different from us, that there's something bad within them. And in fact, there was a racist trope about one drop of blood, having one drop of a certain kind of blood meant that you were then black and that then you had this thing that had to be protected against. The, the archetype of contagion or contamination or toxicity, they're, they're interchangeable, contagion, contamination, toxicity, mm -hmm. has been always associated with those human beings that we need to oppress and we need to control because they bring bad things by their very being. Mm -hmm. In other words, they can't just change their behavior and we can find them acceptable. It's something about them that is within them that we have to cordon off or separate from ourselves. And so, yes, it's been a big part of racism. And, um, and it was a big part of, of uh, witch hunts also. And uh, the, the idea of the witch in the Middle Ages had a lot had to do with her breath and what she could suck out your soul if you came too close to her mouth um, because she, she had these potentials of interacting with you. And um, it was more like sucking you in rather than blowing out on you. But I'm sure there must have been some blowing out also because it was a lot about her breath. So, you know, Again, these, these themes, these emotional themes that are connected to disgust get organized around contamination and contagion again and again and again. And it doesn't go anywhere good ever, as far as I know. And the, you know, the real concern I have right now is the fact that the mask itself doesn't have any science behind it is more mandated and more of a signal now that at least where i live that the curve is flattened in other words now that there's less concern about the actual virus the desire to wear the mask seems to has have increased and the the way that we could enter into changing this um Actually, I just wanted to mention that because I was reading a little bit of research on the issue of um, contamination and disgust and how you deal with it to get people to lower the threat level um, and their feelings. And um, it's by normalization, that is the, um, the willingness to accept inevitable risks in relating to each other Mm -hmm. And then uh, learning that there are benefits that outweigh the risks of relating. So, you know, if we, if we could normalize for people through information, the idea that there's not um, much benefit in wearing the mask and there are real benefits in relating to each other, uh, then people might be able to shift somewhat out of this feeling that wearing the mask is protecting them. Um, I think without normalizing it and without talking about risks and benefits uh, that the masks have already taken on a part of the collective mind and we're moving rapidly in the direction of reading the mask as a virtue signal. You know, whether you're reading it from the side of wearing the mask is good or not wearing the mask is good. Either side is a problem, you know. So I, I think that there is something to be done and something that is somewhat the responsibility of 
those of us who are essential workers uh, to get the word out about the reality of masks and the danger of masks and to, to help people recognize that wearing a mask is a big communication. It's not subtle. And then it takes on unconscious meaning and projective identification enters into it quickly as people uh, you know, decide that they're going to moralize and speak through a bullhorn at each other, telling each other, you know, this is dangerous. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to wear the mask and stop talking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's very dangerous, okay. that way of relating to ordinary people, who, you know. So um, that, that's kind of my, All right. All right. my last thing, <laughs> I think. Um, um, I know that you have to end early because you have another presentation. It's 3.52 and you want to end by 3.55. Um, thank you. Let me just tell you, and I think this can be discussed later, some people were uncomfortable with the assertion about African American uh, African American men not wearing masks as they were treating it as racist. Which other people said, "No, she's noting a phenomenon, not that's right. recommending it." Right. So that's right. I think you may have a bit of an argument in emails. Okay. Well, I, I, I mean, mean, let me just well, let me see if I can clarify that because I'd course, like to avoid course. that particular conversation. Of course. First of all, it was a. It's hearsay. Somebody told me this was happening in Burlington, Vermont. It's not my recommendation. I, I don't make recommendations about mask wearing. Um, I'm not a politician. I'm not a, a, any leader in that way. Uh, number two, the, the person who told me said that, that um, his understanding was it was not mandated for African-American men. And uh, my understanding, again, this is just based on my, uh, my understanding of the issue for African-American men, that they had objected themselves mm -hmm. to wearing masks because of the social signal. This is, oh, not, my, this is not my theory. This is not my idea. I'm not an African-American man. And, um, you know, I, I only brought it up because I think that the complexity of mask wearing is an issue across many different populations, yes, the I meaning think. of it, you know. Absolutely. I hope that's clear now. Yes, I, I think so. Okay. We'll see what comes in emails, but it's clear to many people. So <laughs> thank you very much. A wonderful talk. Um, uh, we do have a launch of the book Breakfast at Kusnok this Wednesday at this time. And then we'll see Andrew Samuels in a little more than two weeks. We'll return to our normal Wednesday. Thank you so much for speaking to us. And let, I want to let you go because I know you have other work to do. It is wonderful to see you. Thank it was you lovely all. to be here and lovely to see friends. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Fantastic. Lovely. I wish we had applause. Take care. <laughs> have a good evening. Thank you.